Oh, hello, everybody, and welcome back to the theater. 12 confirmed, 31 confessed, more than 100 suspected. This is the mark of one of America's first female serial killers. In the previous episode, we explored the legend of Lavinia Fisher, but today we find something far more sinister, truth. It is the stories like these which make us question the value of our past. Everybody interacts with it differently. For some, it is pivotal, these key stepping stones that lead us to who we are. But to others, it is a bad dream, something to be pushed aside so that we might get on with the important work of shaping something better. Then there are those who stand somewhere in the middle, cognizant of the fact that our triumphs and our failures hold an equal place of significance, each honored as moments that molded us into who we are today. For the great majority of us, our future is like a lighthouse. The sea may rage, the fog enshroud us in the totality of our present moment, but that beacon remains a reminder of where we are going as we forge onward. That glimmer that guides us often represents a better life, or more of the same if we are content in the trajectory of our fates. It represents fulfillment, success, and the collecting of richness in the relationships and passions that gives our lives meaning. But what if I introduce you to someone whose lighthouse promised death, destruction, true sadism, and the wreaking of havoc on all things considered good? And what if I told you that this individual felt just as firm in her pursuit of happiness as we do in ours, finding the only difference being where she found it, an avarice for stealing the lives of others, for donning a mask of death at the bedside of those she selected, for deceit, manipulation, and the utmost exercise of control, and that these key elements in her mind constituted a good, fulfilled life. Would you join me in following her? From the beginning, but not merely to the end for today, we embark on a story that has none. It stretches into a hellscape of impossibilities made real, and legacies inspired. My name is Harlequin Grimm, and you are listening to the stories of monsters whose voices are lost in history. And this is Mania. Blood was Honora Kelly's first memory. At six years old, she was just tall enough to see over her mother's bedside, see the handkerchief she'd been using throughout her fever-ridden nights, see the tremors of the bed frame as her mother's coughing fits seized her. Her mother, Bridget, clung to her handkerchief with a cadaverous hand, with blood seeping out onto her palm. Bridget's veins bloomed with azure as her skin became more pale. Her eyes hollowed and darkened, and being too feverish to think clearly, Bridget would hold her youngest daughter's face in her hands, unknowingly smearing it with the blood that so seeped out of her lungs. Nora would come to know that her mother's love left a crimson stain that even something as pure as childhood could run red with tragedy. Soon enough, death approached the Kelly household in the early hours of a Massachusetts winter night. Her long, spindly fingers swept across the bedroom walls as it crawled in through a window, the phantasmic trailings of her robe as icy as the winds that wafted the curtains. Bridget was sitting upright beside her sleeping husband. Death had been courting her for some time now, so when she arrived that evening in the snow-packed silence, it came as no surprise. Bridget knew just as well that she would be leaving Nora and her sister, Delia, to the abusive care of her alcoholic husband. Her hourglass had been upended, the final sands of her mortality to be counted on one hand. The Kellys were Irish immigrants, with little to no wealth to their name. Without a mother, the futures of her children appeared admittedly bleak, but never could Bridget anticipate the true depths of misery to come. What she did not prepare for was the solace she felt in relinquishing control, nor the comfort as death cradled her head, and in sweeping that spidery hand across her face, closed her eyes one last, final time. Her hand fell slack beside the bed, the blood-soaked handkerchief falling from her white knuckles. All the while, six-year-old Nora, having stirred from a bad dream, stood peering through the doorway of her mother's chamber, her tiny feet allowing her to go unnoticed as she watched Bridget's final moments. 
Nora held her breath, watching death at work, and the fluttering of her great sweeping wings as she departed from the Kelly household. A single black feather would dance across the wintry air and bury itself into the child's heart, and there its roots took hold. Before we continue with Nora's story, allow me to thank the community that keeps this show alive. Without patrons and customers supporting the work of the Grimm Theater, projects like this wouldn't be possible. If you find Mania valuable and would like to contribute a subscription, you'll find yourself at patreon.com forward slash harlequin grim. Patrons enjoy early access, exclusive content, even stickers and prints by Astrid Grimm, depending on the tier. Whether you subscribe or simply listen to the show, I'm grateful for all of you for being here. Now, let's continue with the story. Nora's father, Peter Kelly, was struggling as it was before his wife's death. He was known in town for being an eccentric and abusive alcoholic. The locals even nicknamed him Kelly the Crack, as in Crackpot. The following years would prove to be the breaking point of the Kelly family. Peter was a tailor who often took his work home with him. He lacked discipline, responsibility, and the will to raise his children without his wife. All the while, Nora, the youngest child, sat amidst the ruins of a broken household crumbling around her. One evening, she heard strange sounds emanating from her father's bedroom. Instead of the steady thrum of a sewing machine, there were pained gasps and whimpers. Delia joined her sister in investigating to find their father with a needle and thread in hand, hunched over a pair of trousers. The nub of a candle burned beside him, fit to smolder soon. But instead of threading the needle through the pants, Peter was running the thread through his eyelids, as illustrated by the dripping silhouette spattering the wall. Too petrified to intervene, the children watched as their last caretaker spiraled into a blind madness. Delia moved a hand to cover Nora's face, but she swept it away. Once more, a key moment in her memory would be colored by scarlet, this time running down her father's trembling hands. When Peter was finished, he had the same sense he was being watched. Slowly, he turned to face his children. Both eyes were fully sutured shut. The agony was evident in the deep lines of misery on his face, and though historians don't broach the reasons why Peter did what he did, I think, despite all his flaws, he was honest enough to admit that he lacked the courage to see the pain he was causing his children. After finally coming to terms with his inability to raise his daughters, including a third foster child that had been taken in recently, Nellie, Peter took his three children to the Boston Female Asylum in 1860. Left in the care of the staff, Peter looked at his children in the arms of strangers, and after having turned away, would never see them again. No records exist concerning the time that Delia and Nora spent in the asylum. Nellie, being the oldest, was instead committed to an insane asylum. Less than two years after Nora was admitted, in the winter of 1862, she was placed as an indentured servant in the home of Miss Anne C. Topan of Lowell, Massachusetts. Anne already had a daughter, Elizabeth, and though she treated Nora poorly, Elizabeth and her got on well enough. It is here that Nora eventually shed her birth name, instead taking on the name Toppin, though she was never fully adopted. After Anne died, Elizabeth took over the house, treating Nora with more care than her mother. But after Elizabeth married a church deacon, a dispute broke out, causing Nora to leave behind the home she lived in for 20 years. At 33 years old in 1887, Nora began training at the Cambridge Hospital. As a child, she was described as being bright and terrible, but aside from odd quirks like her compulsive lying and compulsion to gossip, it appeared that she had turned a new chapter in her life. She even earned the nickname Jolly Jane for her outgoing personality, which is how she is referred to today. Of course, Jane's eccentricity wouldn't stop at gossip. The hospital administration was disquieted by her obsession with autopsies. She possessed an enthusiasm for exploring the insides of cadavers, 
that even the most ambitious of doctors lacked. For nearly 30 years since her mother's death and father's psychotic break, Jane had seemingly defied the origins of her youth. But at the Cambridge Hospital, in an environment of gore, death, and the slow passing of infirm patients, that shadow of iniquity inside her stirred like a famished beast ready to gorge itself. One patient, Amelia Finney, had an operation in 1887. Jane administered a dose of medicine that caused her to lose consciousness. In watching her patient's body mimic something fatal, a sexual appetite rose up in Jane. Thus began a terrible habit of slipping drugs to patients before climbing into the hospital beds with them. And this is how Jane found her weapon of choice. Poison. Jane went on to secure a job at Massachusetts General Hospital, only to lose it for how recklessly she administered opiates. Even still, doctors recommended her as a private nurse to wealthy clients, where she would go on to make $25 a week. An average salary for a woman at that time was a fifth of that, so she had become quite successful. Outside of professional environments, Jane demonstrated all the qualities of a mentally unstable, dangerous individual. She enjoyed turning her friends on one another, acted out frequently, and was actually disdained by her peers. But to doctors and patients, she donned another mask entirely. Despite her firings, she was seen as a highly skilled, compassionate, and even with a warm bedside manner. Her colleagues, further down the hierarchy of the hospital, knew better. Jane once said openly in nursing school that there was actually no point in keeping old people alive. So say what you might about Jane, she practiced what she preached. Jane methodically befriended her elderly landlord and wife, killing them one by one with poison. She later explained, quite simply, that they had grown feeble and fussy. To her, this constituted their deaths. In 1889, a 70-year-old Mary McClear fell ill when visiting Cambridge. After visiting a doctor, Jane was instructed to look after Mary. One of my best nurses, the doctor assured Mary, who would be poisoned shortly afterwards. Just a month later, Jane set her eyes on a close friend. She poisoned her with strychnine so as to replace her job as a dining hall matron at St. John's Theological School in Cambridge. And she got what she wanted, but the job itself was short-lived. The administration soon was overwhelmed with complaints of an incompetency and missing money. Elizabeth Tapan the daughter who'd befriended Jane as a servant, was another key figure. She often invited Jane to visit and stay in the house she grew up in, invitations that Jane frequently accepted. In the summer of 1899, Jane was vacationing in Buzzards Bay. Elizabeth invited her down to the Cape. Upon her arrival, the two reconnected, and Elizabeth admitted of a chronic depression. Jane, ever the compassionate loving angel of death invited Elizabeth to the beach for a picnic, and what a lovely afternoon they shared, watching the gentle waters slosh against the rocky shores. The meal they had was corned beef with taffy and mineral water, but while Elizabeth was drinking the mineral water, all the while another lethal dose of strychnine was being poured. The cruel nature of this compound is that it induces muscle convulsions. But in the dose that Elizabeth took, it would strangle her, a death by asphyxia. So Jane held Elizabeth in her arms, watching with rapture as she gasped the last of her life out. That left, of course, Elizabeth's now widower, Ormel Brigham. She stepped into his life under the pretenses of wishing to marry, to take over the place of the woman she'd just murdered. Within three days, Jane did away with 77-year-old Edna, the housekeeper. Oramel spurned her advances. Perhaps Jane didn't quite understand that people weren't exactly in the mood for romance with their loved ones and housekeepers, dropping around them like flies. So that makes sense. Curiously enough, when Oramel ordered Jane out of the house, she was distraught, but not enough to take the widower's life, rather instead her own. But for all her expertise and experience in poisoning others, her own overdose of morphine failed to do the trick. At the turn of the century into the year 1900, 
Jane rented a cottage in Bourne from a man named Alden Davis. The Davis family is key to this story, and they would come to know Jane well as she was failing to keep up with rent. When Alden's wife, Maddie, came to collect, Jane simply killed her off with a cocktail of morphine and atropine. As she did with Elizabeth, she moved in with Alden, only this time that widower wouldn't be so lucky. It is here that we reach the apex of Jane's career. From that first indelible mark that death left upon her at her mother's bedside. Over the years, Jane morphed into her own angel of death, exercising ruthless judgment upon those whose final years are already perilously numbered, or those whose love has failed her. She defied her past. A lack of control instructed her to exercise unspeakable power, her own expression of abuse and wanton degrees. After taking care of Alden, Jane moved on to his two married daughters, Minnie Gibbs and Geraldine Gordon, neither of which survived her ability to deceive. What had once been a troublesome renter now became the devastating hand that snuffed out almost the entirety of the Davis family. Jane's safety had always been harbored in the demographics of her victims, the elderly, the sick. She didn't have to so much as lift a shovel to try and hide their bodies, for there was no purpose. When coroners or officials arrived, they suspected nothing. But she'd overstepped her bounds with the Davis family. By 1901, a Massachusetts detective was following Jane keenly. An entire family, dead in a year. It was unthinkable. The dead had yet another ally. Minnie Gibbs' father-in-law was just as suspicious. All it took was the consultation of a toxicologist and a judge to order that Minnie's body be exhumed. The investigation was damning. Morphine and atropine laced her system. On October 29, 1901, our jolly Jane was arrested and sent to trial by the summer of 1902. She confessed to her lawyer that she killed at least 31 people, and perhaps as many as 100. If I had been a married woman, Jane insisted, I probably would not have killed all those people. I would have had my husband, my children, and my home to take up my mind. Okay, sure. But knowing her, I wouldn't trust Jane with a pet dog, let alone a family, to keep her murderous plots placated. Now, do you remember when I told you that this story has no end? It took the jury only 27 minutes to deliberate before finding Jane not guilty by reason of insanity. Now, most might think that she got off easy, and she did. But even Jane wanted to be viewed as sane, in the hopes that one day she'd be set free, if only to allow her to wreak more havoc on the world. In court, she pleaded that she could not be insane, for she knew what she had done wrong, why it was wrong, and knew precisely how to do it. Her ambition, as quoted by her, was to have killed more people, helpless people, than any other man or woman who has ever lived. And indeed, for one of America's first female serial killers, at least, she sets a true precedent. Even the likes of Jeffrey Dahmer and Ted Bundy struggled to keep up with her body counts. So what of Jane's sentence? Where do we go from here? Well, the cliché remains true. Our story ends very much how it begins. Jane was committed for life in the Taunton Asylum for the Insane. Consisting of multiple buildings in lush countryside, Taunton could not be considered justice by any archaic standard of the word for a woman as wicked as Jane. Though perhaps the standard practices for insane individuals back then would be considered barbaric, the institution itself was state-of-the-art, with large, spacious, curving halls, plenty of windows for natural light, and a fully accommodating staff. Given the idea that Jane would be able to manipulate the administration into treating her fairly well, she may not have lived a good life, but at least as good a life as any serial killer might get in confinement, especially in those times. Thusly, our story toils on into the now-abandoned halls of the Taunton Asylum, a desolate city for the mad phantoms still wandering its corridors. Into that curious space where the damned linger, and the stories now burrowed into our hearts, and bloody memories made evergreen. From her mother's demise to her father's madness, into the wanton destruction of her limitless poison, we've arrived precisely nowhere without justice, resolution, nor assurance of a fair world, except perhaps 
for the mercies that even our twentieth century ancestors gave to Jane, America's first angel of death. Thank you for joining me for another episode of Mania. If you enjoyed this story or found it meaningful, consider subscribing over at patreon.com forward slash harlequin grim. Even a subscription for less than the price of a coffee goes a long way. I am eternally grateful for the supporters of this show and my patrons, whether you are contributing a subscription, sharing with friends and family, or merely listening, you are helping the Grimm Theater come to life. Thank you. Now, let's continue with the story. The only details that I exaggerated were Jane's earliest beginnings. In reality, Jane was only a year old when her mother died, although she was undoubtedly changed by the air of tragedy and of course her abusive father, it remains a question if she witnessed her mother's demise with her own eyes. Her father's madness, even his psychotic break involving the sewing of his own eyes, remains a popular account from history, though it would be understandable if the scene involving his eyes being sewn shut was a kind of rumor made real by locals. From there, our story follows with more legitimate accounts from history. All of it does. The quotations by Jane, her motives, her methods, her victims, even the stupefying conclusion that the jury came to. As for the Taunton State Hospital, it was formally closed in the late 20th century. The ruins were kept around for some time before a fire took out most of it, with the rest being demolished rather recently. The scale, the architecture, are hauntingly beautiful. And with that, we bring our two-episode mini-series on America's first female serial killers to a close. It has been my utmost pleasure, and thank you once again for listening, and as always, the theater is ever open to you.